are in Mi'kma'ki, which is the unceded and ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and that we share that um, with them because we are all, in essence, treaty people. And in reflecting on what it is that we wanted to learn from the land acknowledgement, in keeping with SCAN's mission, we wanted to talk about the need for continuous and ongoing learning and knowledge about this issue and about our role in this issue. We also wanted to acknowledge the African Nova Scotian community and their contribution to this land that we call Nova Scotia. So we thank you for being here with us today and we are willing as always to share our land acknowledgement um, with you. It is on our website and we start all of our courses and our presentations with it. And now we get to talk about somewhat less interesting things like washrooms. For catchers, all of their toenails had fallen off because of the way they had to, to sit to catch the ball. I know. So it's that kind of fact you're going to get from Mark today <laughs> when he talks about Sherlock Holmes. Mark's background is in writing um, as a professional journalist. He also, for the last 15 years, has spent um, his time as an IT expert working on websites for the provincial government. But he never gave up writing during that time. And much of what he wrote about was Sherlock Holmes and Arthur Conan Doyle. And so he's going to share that with us today. And the wonderful thing about what Mark shares with us today is that I am sure it will only be the tip of the iceberg because he has presented around the world on this topic. For those of you who are more interested in what lies beneath the iceberg, Mark is teaching a course next term for us on Sherlock Holmes. So during registration, if you're interested, you will be able to sign up for six weeks to learn about Sherlock and the man who created him. But for now, I'm just going to turn it over to Mark and to Sherlock. I have to do it, right? The game's afoot. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the introduction. It was, uh, it was a long time ago that we met, uh, but not so long uh, in Sherlock Holmes years. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's nice to see such a big crowd here and apparently a, a good size crowd online as well. It, a one hour discussion re is really a short discussion on the topic of Sherlock Holmes phenomena. It's a worldwide phenomena and we'll just touch on some of the, the main topics. Uh, we'll look at his early days, uh, his creator, Arthur Conan Doyle, homes on the big screen, homes on the little screen, and we'll bring the discussion up to the present day. Here we go. Today's uh, Sherlock Holmes is not your father or your grandfather's Sherlock Holmes. Uh, today we have images of Sherlock Holmes literally from the cradle. Uh, on, on the left you see a picture book of Sherlock Holmes and the Hound of the Baskervilles. I have it here. It's a, it's a little kid's book and it's for parents to read to their children before they can even read. And it uh, gives them certain words and sounds to go with it, but it does teach them about Sherlock Holmes. Uh, and uh, from the, the middle picture, one of the, one of the final pages inside, we can see Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson around the fireplace. Sherlock Holmes is what, wearing a deerstalker cap and he has his pipe. They're all dressed, they're inside, no one knows why. Uh, but it, it is a, a kid's book, so it's teaching kids who can't even read what uh, Sherlock Holmes is, who he is, the Hound of the Baskervilles, and that he uh, lives with this, this other character, Dr. Watson. The other picture on the screen is, of course, Sherlock Hemlock, who uh, was introduced to uh, Sesame Street in 1970 and has since forever after been teaching kids that this is what a detective looks like. Uh, as, as you can see, he has the Deerstalker cap on and the, the Inverness cape, and he's got a, a magnifying glass, which is always appropriate for Sherlock Holmes. 
Unfortunately, Sherlock Hemlock has a mustache. Most, most Sherlock Holmes don't. Uh, and because it's Sesame Street, he doesn't have a pipe. Uh, but we'll imagine it's in his pocket or something. Okay, so we'll now travel back to Victorian London because in some ways Sherlock Holmes, the Sherlock we all know today is at least in his original uh, formation, a man of London and a man of his times. The original stories consist of 56 short stories and four novels. They were written over a period of 40 years from 1887 to 1927. This was a time when the British Empire was flourishing. If you all remember the, the world map we had in our, our classrooms where pink was the, uh, the British Empire and it went from one side of the, the map to the other. And it was a, a time of the sun never set on the British Empire. And that is certainly the time of Sherlock Holmes' original incantation. However, it was also a time of great disparity uh, in England and elsewhere in the world between the urban poor and the wealthier classes and none so much so as in, as in London itself. When people think of Victorian times today, we think of uh, period dramas, stately homes, and that's kind of where we imagine ourselves, uh, preferably in those stately homes. Uh, truth be told, chances are we would be working in those stately homes or in the, in the you know, with the horses or the underclass of the stately home, uh, we could be lucky and we could be part of the growing middle class, but even those people were struggling each day to keep the, their home over their head. The world of Sherlock Holmes as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle envisioned it rarely touched on the urban poor, although he did have a group of ragtag street children named, named the Baker Street Irregulars uh, and with, but the world of the, the stories uh, is a world of carriages, um, train travel, handsome cabs, and well-heeled clients. The picture in the middle is Sherlock Holmes kind of thinking about one of his cases, and this is a picture from The Adventure of the Red-Headed League, one of uh, the favorites in the Sherlock Holmes world. The picture of the two uh, of Dr. Watson and Sherlock Holmes in a, in a train carriage is from the adventure of the Boscombe Valley. Uh, as I mentioned, there was only 60 stories, and this is the only place where Sherlock Holmes is actually pictured wearing a deerstalker cap and cape. Uh, these are two pieces of clothing that a gentleman, as Sherlock Holmes was, in uh, Victorian times wouldn't have worn except when he was in the country. Uh, so when we see a movie today or a TV show today and you see Sherlock Holmes running around in the deerstalker cap and the cape, it's really more for our benefit to recognize that that character is obviously Sherlock Holmes because the way he's dressed. Uh, he would have been dressed more like Dr. Watson is in the train carriage. Uh, the, the, the deerstalker cap and the cape is more for theatrical reasons. So we're now gonna look at the origins of Sherlock Holmes, or at least the, uh, the man who created him. Uh, this is, on, on the left is uh, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, there he is, he's kind of midlife there with a, a fantastic mustache that he always had. This one's waxed out to the side. So it's the man, the myth, and the mustache. He, uh, he was born on the 22nd of May, 1859, in Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, to a pro prominently, or pro pro primarily, an Irish Catholic family. Although today we see him as the quintessential Englishman, if you ever hear uh, clips of him, and we have a few of him, uh, movie clips of him, uh, you can definitely hear his Scottish accent although he lived a fair bit of his life in England. His father was uh, Charles Altamont Doyle. Uh, sadly, he was a chronic alcoholic, uh, and he spent many years in and out of uh, treatment facilities. Uh, Charles Altamont Doyle died in 1893 at an institution in Dumfries, Scotland, at the age of 61, 
Conan Doyle was 33 at the time of his father's death. Because of his father's uh, chronic alcoholism, the family was supported off and on uh, by a series of wealthy uncles. And at the age of nine, Conan Doyle was sent to a Jesuit prep school in Lancashire. Um, the, it was a prep school for young, young children, and then it, he went into uh, Stonyhurst College, which was associated with that school, uh, which he attended until 1875. In 1876 to 1881, Conan Doyle studied medicine in, at the University of Edinburgh. It was during this time that he met Dr. Joseph Bell, pictured here, uh, who I've, I've called the inspiration for Sherlock Holmes. Uh, in fact, uh, Conan Doyle worked for Dr. Joseph Bell for a while when he was a medical student. Bell had the extraordinary ability to be able to look at a patient. Maybe the patient had said a few words, introduced himself. Bell could look at the patient, look at his clothing, look how he walked in, looked at his trousers, his calluses on his hands, and he could interpret what his malady was, where he was from, and uh, even his, his occupation. In 1892, Conan Doyle wrote a letter to Joseph Bell. And uh, by this time, Sherlock Holmes was uh, just getting underway. But he, he wrote uh, to Bell to make it perfectly clear that he, Bell was a partial role model for Holmes. And he, uh, in the letter, he wrote, it is most certainly to you that I owe Sherlock Holmes. Round the center of deduction, inference, and observation, which I have heard you inculcate, I have tried to build up a man. So there, there's no doubt uh, Conan Doyle was heavily influenced by the observational methods and the scientific methods used by Dr. Joseph Bell. During Conan Doyle's medical school years, he uh, took a year off, or he took some time off, and he became a doctor on a Greenland whaler. And shortly after graduation, he was once again aboard a ship, this time as the local doctor uh, in, on the coast of West Africa. Conan Doyle led a very exciting and robust life. In the summer of 1882, he had established his own medical practice in an area of Portsmouth called South Sea. It was during this time that the myth of Conan Doyle having no patience and lots of time on his hands began writing and, uh, and writing fiction. Truth of the matter is, Conan Doyle was a relatively successful doctor um, and he even began a, a specialty as an ophthalmologist. In his autobiography, uh, he did say that he had few patients and selling a few pieces of fiction uh, during this time, he realized that his true enjoyment and passion in life was uh, writing tales. So he uh, chucked in his medical practice and became a full-time writer. By the 1890s, Sherlock Holmes was a publishing sensation, and Conan Doyle was well on his way to international fame and fortune as a writer. Uh, through the fame and fortune he achieved uh, with Sherlock Holmes uh, and other writing, Conan Doyle led a busy and fascinating life of which we're only touching on a few things here. Uh, Conan Doyle was a great all-round athlete. Donnelly remembers me always writing about sports, and that is one of the, the topics I often write about is Conan Doyle in sports. Uh, he was a national class cricketer. He played rugby, soccer, billiards. He boxed, he golfed. He enjoyed motor car racing when that became popular and he had the money to do so. Uh, he helped introduce skiing to the world and he was de deeply involved in the British Olympic movement. Those are just a few of his sporting activities. Uh, his, his wealth allowed him to travel the world, uh, both on literary tours, and he, he did travel to Canada, although he never came through Halifax, sadly. Uh, and he, the, the, the tours also were used to spread his uh, new religion, uh, and that was of spiritualism. He was a strong spiritualist. In 1903, Conan Doyle was knighted. So we now know him as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, but he wasn't knighted for Sherlock Holmes. He was knighted for the defense of Britain in the Boer War. He had declined the author once, but his mother, who he had a very 
close relationship with, convinced him to accept it. Uh, he also accepted it after he had dinner with the Prince of Wales, and the Prince of Wales suggested that he accept it. Uh, so one can't really turn down the Prince of Wales and your mother. So, uh, so he he did accept uh, the second the second time he he did accept uh, the uh, the knighthood. But the part of uh, Sir Arthur was never to be found on his bylines or any other publicity which, uh, which, he, which he used. Um, Sherlock Holmes was also offered a knighthood and also turned it down. Uh, Conan Doyle uh, told uh, the Strand Magazine editor that he was working with at the time, Greeno Smith, I am a Conan Doyle without any trimmings and will remain so. So uh, his byline right up until his death was always just a Conan Doyle. Uh, Conan Doyle understood that he was uh, a celebrity and the power it had. He took up several issues during his lifetime, including uh, divorce, reform law, uh, miscarriages of justice, and there's books written on, on, uh, on his different uh, um, things on mis miscarriages of justice, and the Belgian atrocities in the Congo. He was even a strong supporter of civilian marksmanship uh, after seeing the poor quality of British marksmanship uh, at the front during the Boer War. He came home and he established uh, uh, a couple um, civilian marksmanships, one on his own property, uh, little clubs that would meet once a week and they would fire off guns at targets. And uh, uh, he actually created a, uh, a trophy, which is still given to this day uh, for marksmanship. Uh, Conan Doyle was also a very social person. He he had a lot of friends, and he he belonged to a lot of clubs, social clubs, especially in late Victorian times. Uh, his friends included H. G. Wells, P. G. Woodhouse, Bram Stoker, Rudyard Kipling, and he was a neighbor of George Bernard Shaw. Conan Doyle married twice, and through the two families, he had five children. He died at his home in Sussex on July 7th, 1930, at the age of 71. So now on to the Sherlock Holmes canon. Uh, Sherlockians call the 60 stories the canon, which is obviously a reference to uh, uh, an illusion used by biblical scholars. Uh, as I mentioned, these were written over 40 years uh, with a 10 year hiatus somewhere in the middle uh, we'll talk more about uh, the Sherlockian hiatus a bit later. The first story ever to uh, feature Sherlock Holmes was published in uh, Beaton's Christmas Annual of 1887. You can see it on the left here. Uh, it was um, a novella, and this, uh, this journal published it in full. Today, this, this journal, if anybody has a copy sitting in their attic or their basement, it is considered the most expensive magazine in the world to buy. A uh, few copies exist. Uh, in 2004, at a Christie's auction, one in good condition sold for 153,000 US dollars. So if anybody has a copy, please let me know. Uh, the, the statue uh, on the right, is uh, of Sherlock Holmes outside the Baker Street tube station in central London. Of course, his address was 221B Baker Street, uh, where he lived for many years with his chronicler, Dr. Watson. There are statues to Sherlock Holmes literally all over the world. Sadly, none here in Halifax, yet. So, so now we'll just take a, a quick look at the Sherlock Holmes canon. As I mentioned, the first story uh, was A Study in Scarlet, a novella published in 1887. Conan Doyle sold it to Ward Lock and Company for 25 pounds. Um, and it was the, the, principal, uh, the principal content for that year's Christmas annual. He was an unknown author. He only got 25 pounds for it. But today, that would have been about 3,000 uh, 3, US dollars. So not terrible, but for uh, major content to a, a, a yearly journal, that's pretty good. In the second story, uh, The Sign of the Four, about three years later, there was a luncheon held in London uh, on August 30th, 1889. J.B. Stoddard, the 
British editor of Lippincott's magazine, who was planning to launch uh, a British edition of the popular US magazine, invited two young authors to join him for lunch and discuss something they could write for his new, uh, his new uh, magazine, Lippincott's. Conan Doyle walked away from the luncheon with uh, an agreement to write The Sign of Four. The other author uh, was Oscar Wilde. And eventually he wrote the picture of Dorian Gray for the same uh, publication. So that's a, a you know a, two young, relatively unknown authors coming together for a luncheon, one creator of Sherlock Holmes and the other Oscar Wilde. Uh, a momentous luncheon, no doubt. Uh, and then after that, uh, within, within a year, there was another miraculous meeting with uh, Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes, Greeno Smith, and The Strand magazine. So The Strand magazine was a new magazine on the market. It was, it was a monthly magazine full of short fiction, general interest articles, a lot of pictures. Uh, I have a, a bound copy here, people can look at during the break. Uh, it, it, it was a new kind of magazine for a new population. Uh, th this is a time of uh, growing urbanization. People could live outside the city and take the trains into London. And on those train rides, they would pick up a magazine like the Strand Magazine, read a couple short stories. They'd be in Oxford Circus. They'd go to work. They'd take the train back, read a few more stories. And magazines like The Strand uh, became very popular. The first edition of The Strand Magazine was in January 1891. And the final edition was in March 1950. Uh, you don't have to do the math. It, there were 711 issues. Uh, so quite a, quite a good run for uh, for a magazine. Uh, magazines come and go quite quite quickly. They the, the publishers knew they had a good thing when they started it. They started printing three hundred thousand copies uh, of their first few issues. They they found out how popular it just was. Within a few issues, they were current. They were then running five hundred thousand copies every month until the nineteen thirties. Uh, after which it kind of steadily declined uh, until they closed in uh, 1950. In 1998, the Strand Magazine was revived as a quarterly, uh, but it really wasn't the same journal, although there are some impressive writers uh, for the current Strand Magazine. The rise of the popular magazine wasn't a coincidence. Uh, improved technology allowed publishers to print 300,000 copies uh, during during a week and have them distributed uh, across England. Uh, the rail network had expanded and the printing and mass transportation allowed magazines like The Strand to print 500,000 copies. Uh, there was also a more literate population this at this time, mainly due to the Education Act of 1870. More people were going to school, more people were staying in school, more people were literate, and they had time that they could read. Conan Doyle was at the right time, the right author, and the right place for the Strand magazine. He thought what he could do was serialize this character that he had created twice before. And the beauty of his serialization that he, that he realized was there was no need to introduce the characters every time. Uh, he has the two main characters, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, he doesn't have to introduce them at every, every uh, story. And he could get right into the mystery after a very short introduction. That introduction is often based around uh, 221B Baker Street, where the, uh, Dr. Watson and Sherlock Holmes are having breakfast and someone rushes in. But with that said, he didn't have to tell anybody about 221B Baker Street, who Sherlock Holmes was, or who Dr. Watson was. They were independent stories with a continuing characters. Uh, the, the first short story to appear was A Scandal in Bohemia. It was in July, 1891. So the magazine started in January, 1891. The first Sherlock Holmes story 
was in July. It was 8,600 words, and Conan Doyle was soon to be a, a, a raging success. So Conan Doyle, of course, was a writer, and all writers are readers. Conan Doyle used ideas for Sherlock Holmes uh, from the stories of Edgar Allan Poe, uh, and who featured the, the eccentric uh, sleuth C. Auguste Dupin, and elements of Emile Gaboreau's tales of true crime, as well as various aspects of Wilkie Collins novels and even some Charles Dickens novels. In 1927, just a few, few years before his death, uh, Conan Doyle was interviewed by Fox Movie Tone Pictures. And he said, Detective stories had always fascinated me, but I was struck by the fact that the results were obtained in nearly every case by chance. I thought I would try my hand at writing a story in which the hero would treat crime as Dr. Joseph Bell treated disease and where science would take place of chance. So with this in mind, this quote in mind, uh, we can see how Conan Doyle created the first scientific detective and also why the public enjoyed the story so much. With the proper clues sprinkled through the short stories, the reader on that train back and forth uh, if they were as sharp as Sherlock Holmes, they could come to the same conclusion. Uh, after the first dozen stories, Conan Doyle was already tired of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, as, as I had said, there are 60 stories. After the first dozen, he had enough of them. Uh, he was tired of a Baker Street detective. The constant need for new plots, new clues, new villains, and the month after month after month after month, because it was a monthly magazine that he was producing for, it kind of warmed down and he was ready for more, uh, more, more other writings, more, more fun. Yet the public asked for more and more. He was persuaded to create another 12 stories uh, and he was uh, persuaded to do this financially. Basically the publishers knew they had a success on their hands and they just threw money at him. And he accepted. Uh, but by the time he, he had agreed to write another 12 stories, so this would have been 24 Sherlock Holmes stories, 24 plots, 24 villains, 24 sets of clues that he had to intersperse in a story, he had decided that, uh, in his own mind, that um, the December, uh, the, the end of this 12 would be the end of Sherlock Holmes as well. Uh, his, he had mentioned it to his mother. His, his mother talked him out of it once. Uh, but by December 1893 edition of the Strand Magazine, uh, The Adventure of the Final Problem appeared. Sherlock Holmes and Professor Moriarty tumble into the Reichenbach Falls, never to be seen again. Uh, we know better. Uh, but at, at the time, the, uh, the outcry from the public was huge. They were uh, inundated by letters, the publishers, and Conan Doyle. So the missing years. Uh, as, as I mentioned, and I love this little illustration on the left, it's Sherlock Holmes was shackled to Conan Doyle and vice versa. Uh, it's a fun little image, but it does show Conan Doyle had written a lot of other things. And he was always remembered and known for Sherlock Holmes. When he was interviewed, he would often be interviewed by the latest about the latest thing, but the, the interviewer would always ask him about Sherlock Holmes and when Sherlock Holmes is coming back, if Sherlock Holmes is really dead, if Sherlock Holmes is going to be on the stage. It was always about Sherlock Holmes for him. Uh, but he felt Sherlock Holmes was keeping him from better work. And for him, that meant well-researched, uh, historical romances. Uh, he wrote uh, The White Company and Micah Clark, two books which uh, are totally forgotten today by most, most people and just aren't enjoyable to read either. They're, they're, they're difficult to read. They're well-researched. He did his work, but compared to the Sherlock Holmes stories, they're just not as readable. Upon Sherlock Holmes' death, as you can see here in, in the middle, there's a Sherlock Holmes and Professor Moriarty grappling on, on the Reichenbach Falls. 
upon his death, the howls from the public were uh, heard across the English-speaking world. Shortly after Holmes's supposed death in the fall of 1894, Conan Doyle was on an American-speaking tour, and this was his first major speaking tour. He said uh, to, the, to the audiences and uh, to uh, reporters, quote, if I had killed a real man, I could not have received more vindictive letters. <laughs> And then he went on to say, it was self-defense. Either he killed me or I killed him. Kondo had some very strong thoughts about Sherlock Holmes. Uh, but um, for the next decade, he basically kept away from Sherlock Holmes. He turned to his historical romances. He uh, wrote short stories for the Strand magazine and others uh, on sport, medical life, horror, and even some science fiction, as well as the fun and fanciful adventures of Gerard. If any of you have read all the Sherlock Holmes stories and are looking for more Conan Doyle, the adventures of Brigadier Gerard are a good place to start. Uh, during those uh, the, the ten year period, uh, some of his major works were the adventures of Brigadier Gerard, uh, Rodney Stone, a, a full length novel about boxing, one of his favorite things and Uncle Burnack, uh, a novel set in uh, Napoleonic times. So here we have the return of Sherlock Holmes, which isn't really the return of Sherlock Holmes. It was The Hound of the Baskerville's 1901. And it was about a, a decade since uh, Holmes had fallen over the Reichenbach Falls. He appears in print again with The Hound of the Baskerville's, a story of, of spectral hound and deepest, darkest Dartmoor. The story is actually set in a time before the Reichenbach Falls, and it fueled the public's thirst for more Sherlock Holmes tales. And finally, the money was too tempting. He had often, uh, publishers were constantly coming up to him and saying, would you write more Sherlock Holmes stories? He kept turning them down. Uh, one publisher, an American publisher, finally came up to him and said, would you? He said, uh, okay, I'm kind of tired of the question. He named an exorbitant sum per story. And without a blink, the publisher said, sure. So he, he knew he was on the hook. Uh, it, was, it was, in today's money, it was somewhere around 100,000 per short story. Uh, so a huge amount, but the publishers knew they, they'd make it back almost, almost instantly. The, uh, the story that brought Sherlock Holmes back in 1903 is The Adventure of the Empty House. The stories continue for another 14 years, and Conan Doyle's wealth and fame grew with it over those 14 years. There were 33 more short stories and one novella, um, which fueled uh, the love of Sherlock Holmes and the pockets of the publishers, and it funded Sherlock, uh, Conan Doyle's New Crusade, that's to spread the word of spiritualism around the world. So right now we're going to take a quick look of Sherlock Holmes as an icon. So at Halloween, it's easy, it's almost too easy to, to dress up as Sherlock Holmes. You, you go to the... Uh, the Halloween store, you get a, a, a fake pipe, maybe a magnifying glass, and the deerstalker cap, and all of a sudden, you're Sherlock Holmes, you run around, you say, elementary, my dear Watson, everybody knows who you are. Uh, and, and down on the, the, the second level, you can even see there, there's costumes for your dog. That's how famous Sherlock Holmes had become. Uh, so you could dress yourself as Sherlock Holmes and your dog as Sherlock Holmes. And there's, there's lots of kids' uh, costumes as well for Sherlock Holmes. But some of these images just represent just how famous Sherlock Holmes is. You only need the alt line on the, on the top left, and you know who it is. Uh, simplified drawings, and you know who it is. In fact, on the, on the bottom right, you don't even have a face. You just have the deerstalker, the pipe, and your companion, Dr. Watson. You know that it's Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Uh, and the Calabash pipe 
is almost always in with these uh, these costumes and these images, despite the fact that he never used one in the original stories. However, like all pop culture icons, Holmes and Watson have evolved since their original uh, creation over, over a century ago. Their characters have changed and the qualities that we love with them have also changed. Um, and you can see just how simplified we can get and we, we still know Sherlock Holmes. In fact, all you have to do is say Sherlock and you know it is. It's, a, it's just a, a one, uh, one name word kind of like Elvis or Cher and you know who it is. So now we're going to look at how he became so famous and that look. So in the Strand magazine, it, there's always a lot of fiction and they're always heavily illustrated. Uh, a lot of pictures with each, with each short story. Uh, the British illustrator who is most closely associated with Sherlock Holmes is Sidney Paget, shown here. He drew 356 illustrations, published illustrations for Sherlock Holmes. Uh, these occasionally do come up. The originals uh, were, most of the originals were saved in the publishing house. Uh, and occasionally the originals do come up for auction. And as you can well imagine, they go for some amazing sums. Uh, my birthday is in May. And as Donnelly knows, she's saving up right now. Uh, in 2004, this image came up for auction. Now it is one of the most famous Im images for the Sherlock Holmes and the Sherlockian community because it is the death of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, however, that image, the original, sold for 220,000 US dollars in 2004. Um, they only go up from there. Sadly, Sidney Paget died at the age of 47 in 1908. And as you can now guess, uh, it was long before the Sherlock Holmes stories had finished. Years later, his brother Walter, who was also an illustrator, illustrated a few of Conan Doyle's other works uh, for the Strand magazine. He was a very popular illustrator as well. But he, he didn't, uh, his brother didn't illustrate any Sherlock Holmes stories. When a scandal in Bohemia was published in the Strand magazine in 1891, readers were greeted with Sidney Paget's drawings. They're kind of moody and they represented Holmes seen here as tall, elegant, and despite uh, all, all this was despite Conan Doyle's original description of Sherlock Holmes as extremely thin with a large nose and small beady eyes. As you can see, Sidney Paget thought better and he drew uh, an English gentleman and the two, uh, the two of them, Dr. Watson, two English gentlemen sitting there in Baker Street. Conan Doyle soon became quite attached to Sidney Paget's elegant version of Sherlock Holmes. And when he met American actor William Gillette, uh, who wanted to play Sherlock Holmes on the stage, he felt his creation had come to life. So we, here we have a, um, a poster for William Gillette's play simply called Sherlock Holmes. Conan Doyle at his core was a writer. Uh, he wrote fiction, he wrote nonfiction, he wrote poetry or a place, he wrote anything he could think of. He, he sold it all. Uh, some of his, the sales were cer certainly on his name. Uh, some of it was just because it was good fiction. When he saw how popular Holmes had become, he thought he'd create a play based on one of his original short stories, uh, that being a speckled band. Uh, that play, nothing really came of it, uh, but because of that play, the idea of Sherlock Holmes on the stage had filtered down to uh, William Gillette, an American uh, playwright and author uh, and actor, and it, it, he, he thought he would play Sherlock Holmes on the stage. After three previews, a play written by William Gillette with some input from Conan Doyle uh, premiered on Broadway on November 6th, 1899. Uh, Sherlock Holmes premiered in July, 1891. Eight years later, he's already hitting the stage in Broadway. 
Uh, now, Gillette is critical to our discussion of Sherlock Holmes and what we think of as Sherlock Holmes. It is this actor who gave us Sherlock Holmes in the Deerstalker cap. It is this actor who gave us Sherlock Holmes with the curved pipe, which I have here, the, uh, the calabash. And it is also this actor who said, elementary, my dear Watson, we have a lot to owe him and he owes us a lot. It is said that Gillette introduced the curved pipe so he could be on stage and people could still see his face. If he had a straight pipe, his, his hand would literally be in front of his face. If he had a, a pipe shaped like this and he held it lower, everybody could still see him. Uh, Gillette played Sherlock Holmes well over 400 times. He had long runs in the US and the UK. The play itself became very popular and he eventually let H.A. Saintsbury uh, star in the play, and Saintsbury actually starred in the Conan Doyle play as well. Uh, Saints, uh, uh, Gillette played it over 400 times, which seems like a lot. Saintsbury played Sherlock Holmes over a thousand times on stage. Gillette became very wealthy from his stage career and from Sherlock Holmes, mainly from Sherlock Holmes. He built Gillette Castle, uh, which is now a state park in Connecticut. So uh, if you're here in Halifax and you want a little road trip to Connecticut, you can go visit. It's a fun place. It, it, it looks like a castle. It looks down upon a river. And Gillette was very much an engineer. And the his house is full of little gimmicks and little ways that he could be in one room. He'd push a button and a door would open somewhere else. Uh, and the, the, the locks on every door is different, and they're all mechanical that he designed. And you can, when you're there, you can kind of look into his workshop uh, that he built the stuff with. You can't actually go into the workshop, but you can look in and see his woodworking. So one thing about Sherlock Holmes that we have to realize is Sherlock Holmes keeps up with the ages. He started... In print, he moved to the stage, and now he, when the silent movie started, so did Sherlock Holmes. He, uh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are incredibly malleable as characters. Uh, there's science fictional Sherlock Holmes where he's set in 24th century. There's uh, Sherlock Holmes set in New York present day. And there is, of course, lots of uh, Victorian Sherlock Holmes. In the silent era, the Earliest surviving Sherlock Holmes film is Sherlock Holmes Baffled, and it was from 1903. It's less than 60 seconds long. It, it depicts Sherlock Holmes sitting in his Baker Street flat, of course, and a burglar comes through a window. Sherlock Holmes gets up. He's about to pounce on the burglar, and the burglar just disappears. And he appears somewhere else on the screen. Sherlock Holmes is about to pounce on him, disappears again. Of course, what we're seeing is stop action movie, uh, but at the time, in 1903, this was just magic. This was an early special effect. And of course, they used Sherlock Holmes to show the special effects of these early silent films. In 1916, so 13 years after this, uh, this early silent film, uh, William Gillette, shown here, uh, starred in a movie of his own play. Uh, the movie was well-known uh, by Sherlockians, but no one had a, a copy of it. Uh, it was thought lost forever. These uh, films often burned up, were lost, were thrown out. However, like a good Sherlock Holmes plot, it was found in a Paris vault in 2014. It had been misidentified and mislabeled, and the film was remastered and had a new premiere in uh, January 2015. Uh, you can find the whole thing on YouTube. We'll, we'll take a quick view of it here uh, in a minute. Uh, it is the Paris version of it, and it's the French version. So if you remember uh, silent films, they sometimes stop the action. Uh, words come up on the screen, and you're supposed to read it. Uh, because it was found in Paris, the words are in French. Uh, so not, not very English. But uh, nonetheless, it is the only copy of this uh, movie that we have. 
the other name, uh, the other, the second name we have on the screen is Ely Norwood. Poor old Ely. In from 1921 to 1923, he made 47 silent films of Sherlock Holmes for the Stoll Picture Productions. Needless to say, he was busy. Conan Doyle saw a few of these, and uh, he was he was much impressed by Ely Norwood's portrayal of Sherlock Holmes. He kind of looked the part. Even if it was a silent film, we never knew what he sounded like, but he certainly looked the part. In 1922, John Barrymore, the great profile, uh, played Sherlock Holmes in a movie as well. It is simply titled Sherlock Holmes. And that, uh, the John Barrymore movie can also be found on YouTube. Uh, next, we're going to show a 90 second clip of the lost film, which is no longer lost. Um, and as, as I mentioned, it is a uh, French version. Who knows what's going to happen? Uh, the, the scene is actually based on a scene Conan Doyle wrote um, in the, the, uh, the Final Problem, which is when the two of them meet and eventually go over the falls. Uh, that's Ernest Maupin as Moriarty. Uh, and obviously, Bonjour Sherlock. So it, it's odd that he calls him Sherlock and not Holmes, but. Maybe he, he knew of the BBC series coming up. Uh, so after that, in 1931, we're kind of jumping ahead a bit here. Uh, 1931, The Speckled Band, which was uh, the play written by Conan Doyle based on his uh, short story. Raymond Massey as Sherlock Holmes. Uh, it's a Canadian connection, of course. Raymond Massey was born in Toronto in 1896. He was the son of Anna Vincent and her husband, Chester Daniel Massey, the wealthy co-owner of Massey Harris Tractors. Uh, next, we're going to show a one-minute clip from the movie. Uh, Lynn Harding is Dr. Grimsby Rylott. Uh, it's based around, uh, as I say, the, the, the speckled band. Grimsby Rylott is uh, one of the characters, the, the bad guy in uh, the speckled band. And... If you look closely, you can quickly see Dr. Watson. He doesn't have much of a, a, a part in this uh, this little clip we're saying. He was played by Atoll Stewart. Sir, it's Grimsby Rylock. Hmm. 
healthy place and obviously very good for the lungs. I thought of going there myself, hmm, almost a year ago. To uh, stoke the manor, sir? Yes. He said it was healthier for me to remain in Baker Street. It certainly was. I'm not sure. I find such places usually suit me. Uh, I doubt it. It's still possible that I may make the visit. Uh, you can kind of see poor old Watson there behind him. Uh, and uh, yeah, a bit of a Canadian connection in the early uh, movie of Sherlock Holmes. Next, we're moving to Rathbone and Bruce. Uh, certainly the Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson of, of a generation. From 1939 to 1946, well-known British actors Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce co-starred in 15 films and over 200 radio plays as Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. To many fans, they are the ultimate personification of Conan Doyle's detective and doctor. Rathbone was a uh, South African born, uh, but he, he moved to England uh, for his uh, theatrical career. He rose to prominence uh, as a Shakespearean actor and went on to appear in over 70 films in his career, uh, mainly costume dramas, swashbucklers, and occasionally even horror films. Uh, Rathbone is now most widely recognized as Sherlock Holmes, despite uh, all the other work he did. So in 1939, this series of films began by 20th Century Fox creating Two movies in the same year, uh, The Hound of the Baskervilles and The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, they were set in Victorian times, as were the originals, obviously. And uh, they're, they're based loosely around some of the original works. And of course, Hound of the Baskervilles, the, the original novel. Later installments, so after, after these two movies, uh, Universal Pictures picked up the contracts and began a series of Sherlock Holmes movies starring these two. The first movie was called The Voice of Terror in 1942, and they were set in, set in contemporary times, and they often had World War II-related themes. So there's uh, some of the movie posters from 20th Century Fox, um, this series, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. The first two movies are very good with, with, and they had a good budget. 20th century took it over and they, uh, or sorry, Universal Studios took it over and, uh, the series was updated and had Holmes investigating Nazis and produced, uh, B-grade films. Rathbone and Bruce continued the series uh, despite the change in studios. And, uh, you know, th these films are easy to find um, on streaming services, on YouTube, and they're still fun to watch. Uh, but if you wanted to start either of the first two 1939 movies, it's a good place to start. So after Rathbone and Bruce, it, there was a long, there is and was a long list of movies. Um, this is just a, a few of kind of the major contributions. Uh, I started in 1965 with for a reason. Um, it's a study in a study in terror. It starred the late John Neville, who uh, lived here in Halifax for a while when he was artistic director of Neptune Theater. It's uh, it's another version of Sherlock Holmes and Jack the Ripper. Uh, most recently at, at, at the bottom, and in this list you have some humorous Sherlock Holmes movies. There's even uh, The Great Most Detective, um, which is an animated movie. You have uh, 2009 and 2000, uh, 2011, uh, which was Robert Downey Jr.'s uh, try of Sherlock Holmes. They're kind of rock and sock and adventure movies. And at the end, we have Miss, uh, Enola Holmes, uh, two movies, 2020 and 2011. Uh, they didn't make a huge 
impact on uh, the, the theater going public. But once again, uh, Enola Holmes was supposedly uh, the fictional sister of Sherlock Holmes. And as I said, the, the movies aren't, aren't the, the two movies aren't great, but they kept Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson in front of uh, the public once again. Uh, he's rarely out of the public eye. So we'll now move to the television Sherlock Holmes. As I said, he Sherlock Holmes is always moving with the times. So quite naturally, he appeared on the small screen as well. Uh, so we're jumping, uh, well, I guess back to 1983. Ian Richardson uh, made two movies uh, in 1983, uh, The Sign of Four and The Hound of the Baskervilles. Both are great films, but are greatly over, overshadowed by what happened next year. And that was when Jeremy Brett started the Granada series. So Ian Richardson's films are good, fun to watch, and they'd probably be remembered more in the Sherlockian world if it hadn't been for the beginning of the Brett series. The Brett series lasted 10 years. In 2010, uh, the BBC began a new series of Sherlock Holmes uh, stories, uh, this time called Sherlock, and it was starring Benedict Cumberbatch, a rising star, but by no means the star he is today. And uh, we can't forget Elementary with Johnny Lee Miller and Lucy Liu as Dr. Joan Watson, uh, which had a seven-year run uh, and many, many episodes. So we'll, we'll now take a, a quick look at Jeremy Brett. Uh, there was 41 episodes. So this is just, this is a quick overview. A, a, a great actor, and he really became famous for his role as Sherlock Holmes. And he was really a new Sherlock Holmes for a new generation, the generation after ba Basil Rathbone. These were close dramatizations of the original stories. Uh, as I said, 40, 41 episodes. Some are good, not all. Uh, but they often used uh, direct quotes from Conan Doyle's original works. And if you look through the Strand magazines, uh, at the, at the images, and then you look at the Jeremy Brett, you'll often see pictures that are set up to look exactly like original uh, illustrations, mainly Sidney Patchett's. There was two Watsons uh, through the series. Uh, the first Watson left after the first, first series. Both did a great job. They were both great foils and friends to Jeremy Brett's uh, Sherlock Holmes. The Canadian Connection, as there always is one, uh, is that in 1958, Jeremy Brett married actress Anna Massey, who was the daughter of Raymond Massey, who we saw in the 1931 Speckled Band. There's a whole group of Sherlockians around the world, some of them are probably watching on Zoom, who know all the interrelations between different movies, different TV series, who played who, uh, who was married to who, who was a set designer, who was the music person. The The into a world of the Sherlock Holmes on, on screen is, is quite something. So after Jeremy Brett, we have Sherlock. The, uh, another generation later, and a new Sherlock Holmes. It began in 2010. Everything is updated, except the address. As you can see, he's still at 221B Baker Street. Uh, and it, it is a dramatization of the original stories, although greatly updated. They're vaguely related to the original stories. Uh, we have a new Dr. Watson. Uh, this time it's Martin Freeman. And he fought in Afghanistan, just as the original Dr. Watson had. Uh, but this Dr. Watson fought in the latest war in Afghanistan. There's cell phones, social media, et cetera, et cetera, with this series. They were the new duo in Baker Street and a huge fandom grew up around them. And that fandom still exists today. If you uh, Google pictures of Sherlock Holmes, you often come up with these two, more than uh, Jeremy Brett and far more than Basil Rathbone. The next slide is a bit of a promo of uh, The Abominable Bride. Uh, this series had four seasons and 13 episodes. One was a 90 minute movie basically Victorian, 
and we'll see a, a little um, little promo that they had before the movie was released. This was 2016. The stage is set. The curtain rises. We are ready to begin. You promised to keep him safe. You promised. Come, Watson, come. The game is afoot. Well, Holmes, surely you must have some theory. We all have a past, Watson. Ghosts. They're the shadows that defy our every sunny day. Every great cause has martyrs. Every war has suicide missions, and make no mistake, this is war. Impossible. Fear is wisdom in the face of danger. It is nothing to be ashamed of. From the beginning, then. A moment. Extraordinary. What a life those gentlemen lead. Yes. So we end on uh, a scene of uh, Sherlock Holmes and uh, Watson in a train carriage, uh, pretty much just like the scene uh, we started in one of the first uh, slides. And as you can see, the, most of the series was set in modern day London. But uh, for this movie, they went back to Victorian times for fun. Uh, now, CBS's series called Elementary, it had over 150 episodes. Uh, as the, the, the third note said, by the end of the second season, Johnny Lee Miller became an actor who portrayed Sherlock Holmes more than anyone else on television or film. That's the second season. It lasted seven seasons. So it's going to be a long time before anybody beats Johnny Lee Miller and Lucy Liu as Dr. Joan Watson. Uh, she played a, a great doctor as well. Is it Sherlockian? Mm, uh, Sherlockians tend to disagree. Uh, it's, it's a standard police procedure. Uh, two main characters loosely based on the traditional Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Uh, if you like police one-hour dramas, it's a fine series. If you're a true Sherlock Holmes fan of the original stories, you're not going to enjoy it so much. Um, however, more recently, always, always updating Sherlock Holmes CBS, the same uh, company that, that made Elementary, has just announced just last week that it has a new TV show uh, called Watson, uh, which is going to be based on, obviously, the Dr. Watson character, uh, not so much the Sherlock Holmes character. It's updated to today. It's set in Pittsburgh, but filmed in Vancouver. Uh, and right now, it sounds a bit like the TV show House, that some of you may remember, which had very strong Sherlockian ties as well. Uh, we'll see what this latest incarnation of uh, The Good Doctor is like. And Sherlock Holmes today. As you can see, Sherlock Holmes is uh, is everywhere. Little Pushkin, um, Sherlock Holmes cat. We have Sherlock Holmes rubber ducky here. And, and, and I always I always take it to the local meetings just to remind everybody to, uh, to keep it light. Um, this is all meant to be fun. Conan Doyle was a popular writer. He wasn't writing Shakespeare. Uh, that was already done. Um, so Sherlock Holmes today. There's an international community of Sherlockians. Uh, Zoom certainly helped. In January, every year, Sherlockians from around the world come to New York, and they're based that, that January weekend is based around the Baker Street Irregulars uh, members only club. Uh, but the whole weekend, which starts Wednesday and ends Sunday, so it's a long weekend, is just full of Sherlockians coming to New York, seeing each other, going to dinner, going to lectures. Uh, there's a cocktail reception, there's dinners. It, it's, it's a long weekend. Hundreds, hundreds of Sherlockians come to New York every January. The, uh, the London Sherlock Holmes Society, which formed just a couple weeks after the New York Society, uh, there's some thought that the New York Society jumped the gun and rushed to their first meeting so they could be the first. Uh, but the London Society of Sherlock Holmes, anybody can join. You plunk down your money and you're a member and you get their journal. The Japan Sherlock Holmes Society is the largest in the world. Uh, 
It has 1,300 members. Uh, and here in Canada, we have the Bootmakers of Toronto, which is roughly a national club. Uh, and it is based, or it has a loose affiliation with the Arthur Conan Doyle collection in Toronto at the Toronto Reference Library. That collection is one of the world's largest publicly accessible Conan Doyle collections. It has his original man, some of his original manuscripts, his original letters, notes, all in his own hand, and of course thousands of books, periodicals, um, paintings, artwork, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Locally, we have the Spence Monroe's. Uh, it's a local Sherlock Holmes Society been going on for about 40 years, and it meets four or five times a year. And we talk about everything Sherlock Holmes related, Conan Doyle related, and just good to see everybody. So that is my talk today with a final uh, illustration by Sidney Patchett. So. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> I'm just wondering why rates for freelance writers haven't gone up since Sherlock's time, but we uh, will talk about that later. Um, right now, we are going to take a break. We have wonderful treats, coffee, um, tea. Please help yourself. Washroom down the back. And then we will come back and we will throw some questions at Mark. Um, I want to see who's going to be the first person that says, wait for it, cocaine. Oh, yeah. All right. So enjoy your tea of um, audience members. We're going to ask um, something of each of you. So for the people at Hope United, um, we'd like the people on Zoom to be able to hear your question. So if you have a question, would you just raise your hand? And some lovely person is going to go running up with this mic, and you're going to be able to ask your question. And in some cases, Mark will repeat it as well. And for the people on Zoom, we would ask if you would put it in the Q&A. The chat is not being monitored. So if you put it in the Q&A, Bill or Colleen will read it out, and Mark will repeat it, and we'll have some, some questions. So without further ado, let's dive into some questions on Sherlock Holmes. Must be at least one question. Oops. Do you know how he created the name Sherlock Holmes? Okay. The, the question is about um, the name Sherlock Holmes. The, the Holmes is pretty much nailed down to Oliver Wendell Holmes, who he was quite a, quite a fan of. Uh, the Sherlock is kind of lost to, to the, the myths of time. Um, there's different thoughts. He was originally in, the, if, if uh, the original manuscript to a study in Scarlet still exists, it's in a, a library somewhere. And he was originally called uh, Sherinford Holmes. And Dr. Watson was Ormond Sacker. So thankfully he changed Dr. Watson's name. Uh, Sherlock, we're, we're almost fortunate. Um, he changed it to, to Sherlock. Um, it's such an odd name that, you know, uh, the BBC just called a series Sherlock and everybody knew who it was. Uh, you could walk into a, a, a movie producer today and say you want a Sherlock movie. Everybody understands what it is. The, the name Sherlock, it, it is unusual. Uh, there's a couple thoughts. One was it was from a rugby or a cricket player that he knew in, um, in school. Uh, there was a, a Sherlock that uh, he knew. And there's a couple other theories of different parts of the name coming from different characters. But Conan Doyle never really said as much as he did about Dr. Bell, exactly where the character was from. So the, the name Sherlock is still still to be lost or still to be found. Who knows? Hi, Mark. Uh, excellent lecture. Uh, I was curious about how you got 
so involved and so interested in uh, Arthur Conan Doyle and Sherlock. And also, if you had to give one character trait that uh, you admire or find most interesting about Sherlock. Uh, so the question is how, how I became involved. And the, the, as for a character trait, I'm not, I'm not sure what it would be. Uh, maybe observational, where <laughs> I'm not so keen. Um, my father gave me uh, two books at uh, Doubleday, uh, printed in 1930, and it was the the entire Sherlock Holmes set by Conan Doyle. And I remember reading it as a child. And um, remember in grade, I just have vague memory, something four or five, taking one of the books to class where the teacher would read to us, and she read one of the Sherlock Holmes stories. And uh, then years later, I, I would just always pick them up once in a while. Uh, the, the stories always stand up, most of the stories, stand up uh, to rereading and rereading again. And I had come across uh, Ronald DeWall's World Bibliography of Sherlock Holmes uh, at uh, Back Pages used bookstore in Halifax. And in it, I, I kind of flipped through and I realized that DeWall had cataloged someone's collection. And then, then I realized how big the world of Sherlock Holmes was. And he had cataloged all the movies, all the silence, uh, pamphlets, books and books and books and books. But he also cataloged Sherlock Holmes societies in the back of the, uh, back of the book. And this was in about 1980. Um, I started writing to the clubs alphabetically um, and I just asked them what they did. I had no idea and uh, just by luck I had written to a club called the Brothers Three Moriarty. Uh, Professor Moriarty was supposed to have uh, brothers all named James um, and I, I, I heard back from a John Bennett Shaw in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Now he later uh, I found out he kind of a bit of a Johnny Appleseed for Sherlockians. And he would encourage anybody and everybody to be a Sherlockian and start their own club. And I corresponded with him monthly for years, years. And uh, he encouraged me to look more into Sherlock Holmes, read all the stories, uh, start my own society in Halifax because there wasn't one. And he also knew, he, he was a sports fan. And he, so a lot of our correspondence was basically just about sports. Um, he lived in Santa Fe, but he was a Chicago Cubs fan. And uh, he encouraged me to look into Conan Doyle and sports. And it was from that that I would uh, start writing articles, doing research. And when you research Conan Doyle's life, you, it's hard not to do a, a surface glance. He had such an interesting life, so. Sir. A couple of questions mm -hmm. here from folks in the Zoom. Uh, first one, I seem to recall that Holmes took hallucinogens. Uh, can you comment on whether that was for clarity or depression? Right. The, the, the idea of Sherlock Holmes and his cocaine. Um, yeah, it was a 7% solution, so it was very weak. Uh, at, at the time, uh, cocaine, you just go down to your, your chemist and, and order uh, any amount of cocaine. Uh, Sherlock Holmes was also uh, quite the chemist, so he, he could mix it up himself and know that he was getting a 7% or 8% or whatever, and he would inject it. And he said it was basically for ennui uh, when uh, he had no, uh, no cases and his mind was racing. And it, he at one point said it was like a, uh, a train uh, just tearing itself to pieces. So... Uh, another one, uh, did Doyle and Agatha Christie know each other personally, and was Doyle an influence on Christie's writing? Right. The, the connection between Agatha Christie and, uh, and Conan Doyle, whether, I'm, I'm not sure if they met or not. Um, they, they certainly, uh, she was certainly influenced by Sherlock Holmes and Conan Doyle, although almost all uh, mystery authors after Conan Doyle were influenced by him. Uh, it would be almost impossible not to be. Uh, they were certainly members of the, the same crime club, 
uh, club of uh, detective uh, and mystery writers. Uh, so they would have, they certainly would have known a lot of the same people if they didn't know each other. So. I'm just curious if the, uh, who owns the copyright? Oh, oh, uh, the, the questions about uh, the copyright of Sherlock Holmes. That, that's a, a very interesting question. Uh, Sherlock Holmes is now free of copyright. Uh, the entire 60 original stories is now completely free. They, uh, most of it was free until a few years ago. And then just uh, a year or so ago, they all became free. Uh, the Conan Doyle estate, uh, there is no direct descendant of Conan Doyle anymore. Uh, the, there is uh, a, a, an estate uh, with lawyers, and the lawyers are fairly litigious, and uh, they've been very litigious since his his death. Uh, they the estate at the time of his death and since um, was worth millions. It was generating huge amounts of money for Conan Doyle's heirs. Uh, the final few are grand nephews and grand nieces and whatnot. Uh, you can still contact them if you wanted to write a Sherlock Holmes story and get their blessings, but you don't have to anymore. And they certainly um, were very litigious on early movies into the 80s and 90s. If someone wrote a, a Sherlock Holmes book or put together a TV show, if you didn't contact them and pay your money, you were certainly hearing from their lawyers. So. Uh, there's one more comment here, or actually, no, two. Another one just came up. Uh, what is the connection between Holmes and real private detectives in Victorian London, such as Field or Pollocky, if any? Right. The question is about uh, Sherlock Holmes and, and real detectives uh, in Victorian England. Um, there, there were detectives in Victorian England. Uh, they, they certainly weren't Sherlock Holmes. Uh, although, although there was one who advertised as being a real Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes. He used uh, Sherlock Holmes' fame in his own ads. And uh, we don't know if uh, Conan Doyle was upset, but you can still find that ad occasionally. Uh, no doubt the, any real detective today or in Victorian times would uh, read the stories and kind of scoff that uh, everything works out and he finds the the culprit awfully quickly. And the last question from the audience, this is more of a comment than a question. Mm -hmm. Not so much a question, but an observation. Those illustrations of the Holmes stories remind me of some of the pictures in early Nancy Drew mystery books. I'm sure the series was inspired by Sherlock Holmes stories. Yeah, the, the uh, Nancy Drew, the Hardy Boys, um, I'm sure they, they were all influenced by Conan Doyle and the illustrations, certainly the, the simple um, black and white illustrations. Uh, as I said, almost any writer after Conan Doyle was heavily influenced by him. He, uh, he was one of the first people to write uh, about a mummy coming back to life. And now we have a whole genre of that kind of, that kind of stuff. Uh, he wrote about the lost world, uh, where dinosaurs were found in South America on a plateau. Uh, his, his, his imagination was so far and so wide that he affected generations of writers afterwards. So, Mark, who's your favorite? Well, Sherlock Holmes, the original, was always my favorite. Uh, for me, it's, it's uh, Jeremy Brett, uh, just because I was reading... Uh, and getting into the world of Sherlock Holmes when those were still on uh, and being premiered. Uh, looking back, the Basil Rathbone films are good fun, uh, but except for the first two, they're not very Sherlockian, opposed to uh, Jeremy Brett, where they, they really did look at the original stories. Um, I just wondered, was it, did Conan Doyle also take drugs? And also, I wasn't sure whether it was him or Sherlock Holmes. And also, wasn't there something about playing the violin? 
Right, right. The, the questions about uh, Conan Doyle taking drugs and uh, the violin. Uh, Conan, not that I, I, I don't believe Conan Doyle uh, took drugs. He, uh, he wasn't much of a, a drinker either. Um, he was a medical doctor, and during his uh, one of his early days, he wrote a, a, um, a paper on, I think it was called Jalcinium, and the use in who would inject it into his eye to see it as a local anesthetic. Um, so that, that part of him in drugs is well known. Uh, he got very, very sick from uh, the self-injection and stopped it, uh, but he still wrote about it. Um, and the violin, yeah, uh, Sherlock Holmes is supposed to have played the violin, um, is, I guess quite well, according to Dr. Watson. Uh, it's, it's not always portrayed as being quite well in the, in the series. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Uh, I don't believe Conan Doyle played any musical instruments. Uh, his sisters may have, but uh, I don't believe he did. So. Deduction is at the heart of Christie's uh, Murder on the Orient Express, mm -hmm. and it has a locked room mystery. How would you compare the relative talents of Sherlock Holmes and Hercu Her Hercule Poirot uh, in this regard? Uh, right, the, the locked room mysteries uh, and uh, the Orient, Mr. in the Orient Express for Agatha Christie. Um, well, the I guess the Conan Doyle's first uh, kind of locked room mystery is uh, the sign of the four, where someone is found uh, dead in their room and they have to find it out. Sherlock Holmes figures that out basically in a few chapters and it took Hercule Poirot an entire novel. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, how much did current events transfer over into the fictional characters? Things like, I don't know, the Whitechapel murders, the Boer War, World War I, Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. Um, right, the questions about Conan Doyle writing and Sherlock Holmes stories and and today's or um, news events of the day, uh, you, you kind of have to read into the stories. Uh, but there was definitely, definitely times that you could see uh, the, the news of the day, uh, certainly Watson coming back from the Afghan war, uh, being injured. Um, the, uh, the other other characters uh, that were often military, you could kind of track down their their regiments and whatnot and see if it was true. Uh, there's there's two ways of, of reading the stories. A lot of Sherlockians like to think they're all nonfiction, so everything was happening, uh, and all the books should be put in nonfiction at chapters, um, and then other people just like to read them as, as fiction. Uh, but Conan Doyle was certainly influenced by current events. He was an incredible reader. Uh, names, places, dates, if, if you really read into the stories, you can see um, veiled uh, times and, and people. So he sometimes would, uh, Sherlock Holmes met the prime minister without naming who it was. He met the, supposedly met the queen without naming uh, so yeah, there, there's a lot of um, of the time, and the, the, you know, and he also would Conan Doyle and and in the Sherlock Holmes stories, just mention as an aside that he was going to see a Scarlatti, or he was going to a certain play, or a certain um, Watson was going to play billiards or something, and a lot of it just as an aside puts Sherlock Holmes in London of that day, which helps make it more believable. Um, he, he was writing nonfiction, but he'd in, insert uh, fictional people and fictional places and times uh, to help make it real. Thanks. Our book club did a historical fiction book called Arthur and George, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, and I think there was a movie. Yeah. So I can't recall. George, I thought, was from India. In the, At least it was in the movie. Um, if that is based on historical fact and 
what the background was of George because it was quite interesting when we read the book. Right. Uh, the, the questions about uh, Arthur and George. Um, yeah, the, that is one. When, when I mentioned he was a campaigner for uh, thing, uh, miscarriages of justice, that was one of them. It was George Edelgy. Uh, Edelgy? Edelgy. Um, and he was uh, the son of a Parsi uh, um, clergy in <clears throat> rural England. And he was accused of a series of sheep mutilations. Oh, that's right. And yeah, basically, that. they kind of chose him because he was the oddball in the community. And um, later, Conan Doyle looked into the case, um, kind of put on his Sherlock Holmes hat, and <clears throat> found that uh, it, ju it just wasn't so. And he later um, got some justice for George Adalji. So it's, and there are at least two or three books uh, on the case. One just came out a year or so ago. And the movie was pretty good. It, was the author Julian Burns? Or? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Not all dusty. Right. Thank yeah, you. George, uh, Julian Burns uh, must have done a tremendous amount of research and just waiting for him to show up at any Sherlock Holmes meeting now. So. <laughs> Uh, this may be a heretical question, but um, given that Conan Doyle sort of um, got tired of writing the books at one point, but was making a lot of money, the you know the Hardy Boys sort of inspired this question because there was no Franklin W. Dixon. Mm -hmm. There was a team of writers. So, is there any evidence that you know Conan Doyle had any help writing? any of the books or had a team that worked yeah. with him or anything like that? Right. The, qu the question is if uh, Conan Doyle had any help writing the Sherlock Holmes story. Uh, no. He, he had um, uh, some influence on uh, some, some people gave him story ideas. Uh, and years and years later, someone uh, believed they, they found a, a lost Sherlock Holmes story when they were going through his papers. And it turned out it was someone had written the story and sent it to him. And then he just put it in a drawer somewhere and they later found it among his papers. Uh, no, the, the manuscripts for almost, or for a lot of the stories are existent and they're in his hands. Uh, yeah, they were all handwritten. And it, it's, it's kind of discouraging to, to see them because he made so little corrections to his writing when, uh, com compared to myself on the slides or whatever else. He, uh, he really had a clear idea of what he wanted to say before he put it down. Um, so no, he, um, I think his mother had given him a few ideas as well. So he had a very close relationship with his mother. And uh, The Hound of the Baskervilles was first dedicated to um, uh, Fletcher Robinson, um, a friend of his who was golfing with him in a golf uh, resort in uh, Dartmoor and told him about this legendary hound of the area. So Conan Doyle thanked him for the idea. Uh, and Conan Doyle also got, we believe, ideas out of the newspapers, current um, crimes. He was, he, you know, his, his, his library and his just reading ability was, was immense. Thanks. Um, other than the housekeeper at Baker Street, uh, what women were played a part in the life of Sherlock Holmes, if any? Right. Uh, right. The questions about women in the Sherlock Holmes story. Um, well, of course, as you mentioned, the, the housekeeper Martha Hudson, um, who uh, who probably became very wealthy off his years and years and years of tenancy. Uh, even even during his time when he wasn't there, uh, Mycroft, his brother, was paying uh, paying the rent. Um, the the first short story is Scandal in Bohemia, where Irene Adler uh, gets the better of him, and he actually kind of fails in that very first short story. Uh, the first two novels, Sherlock Holmes succeeds. The first short story he writes for uh, for the Strand magazine, uh, Sherlock Holmes fails relatively. 
and uh, to who he was later to be referred to as the woman. Uh, and then uh, throughout the rest of the stories, there's a lot of uh, female um, uh, clients. So, and of course, Dr. Watson was married at least once. Um, it, it's hard to tell. Conan Doyle kind of played fast and loose with the dates, uh, places, times, and even marriages of Dr. Watson. So there's uh, certainly, um, he, he married Mary Morriston, uh, who is uh, uh, from one of the first novels. All right. Thank you for your time and your patience. Yes, thank you, Mark. That was absolutely wonderful, right? And it, what it does is it makes you want to go now and read something about Sherlock Holmes, right? Um, we want to thank you for coming. Just a um, reminder that classes are about two weeks in. Some of them are on Zoom or hybrid, so if anybody wanted to register late, some of the classes you would be able to see um, the original two courses. The next term will start April, May, and Sherlock will be front and center um, in, that, in that next series. Um, so please, if you're a member, then look forward to that. If you're not a member, this is your lucky day. You get to join. Life is good, is it not? The other thing that SCANS has done is um, it now has its own Instagram account. And we would all love you to go and follow us on Instagram. We have, I think we've just put it up and I think we've got about 20 followers. Our goal is to be Taylor Swift and have 20 million followers, but not have the Kansas City Chiefs win. See, it just, it comes up again. It's just painful any way you look at it. So let us go back to something pleasant. Thank you for coming. And Mark, that was absolutely fabulous. Thank you very much. Take care. <laughs>